record. Okay. I hope all our audience will come. So firstly, so firstly, I will I will give a brief introduction of our, this uh, workshop. So this workshop, uh, you see my screen, you can see my screen. Yes. So we, yeah, it's uh, called the Data for X app and organized I'm year one by, right now I'm, I'm a postdoc researcher at uh, Hong Kong University of Science and uh, Technology, but previously I did my PhD with uh, Dr. Rahimi in Daphne at in France and uh, Dr. Lee uh, Hong is my collaborator to co-organize this, this workshop. So the motivation of this workshop is to promote some shareable and standardized data set for XR research. For example, we, when we have a user that navigates or do some activities in which reality or in, with augmented reality, we, we expect to have some close loop of feedback from the from the user by knowing his physiological response. For example, so EEG, HRV, or EDS kind of so we know the users in his emotion combination or cyber sickness and gain some useful feedback. And in this case, we call some AR plus uh, XR. So some examples, so for example, in the, in the future, we are, called, we are developing metaverse. People can first to have a visual avatar to talk with others, but the visual avatars need to know, through the visual avatars, so we want to know people's emotion. We want to know some of uh, their, their face, what they are thinking to make uh, the avatar more vividly. And uh, for example, also big data in the big data, we should have something useful as compared with the people in the AI field, because I see some other conference, CVPR in computer vision, they have many, many data set to develop this useful sense to test the algorithm. So we invited the prof. That is the same university, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's an international fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineer and IIE fellow and SM distinguished scientist and a member of Academy, Academy Europe. So he will give us the speech about the Hitchhiker's Guide to Metaverse. He proposed has some key point. Uh, it's, for example, in the future, the virtual world will mix and coexist with the physical world and in such an immersive way so that we can tell what is real and what is virtual. And he envisioned the future metaverse is a multiple, multiple world and reality will die and long live for the reality. So at the, at the end of our at the end of our paper presentation, so he will come and give us his ideas, his envisions for the future metaverse fit life. So this is uh, the papers that we will present. So firstly, we have Majid, and then next we have T-Bot, and the third is Estelle, and the next final one is Chen, Chen Yang, and, uh, and the next Pan Hui keynote, and, uh, and that's the end of the, this workshop. So by the way, here is the, as an uh, advertisement from uh, uh, my colleague, uh, my colleague and Rahami uh, Shaknoni and uh, Michaela Langvoy and uh, Pan Hui, they are organizing a special topic on the journal Frontiers in Virtual Reality and uh, with a research topic, uh, developing the next generation XR, so trustworthy human-centered XR, they are calling some some of the submissions with on this topic. I, I left a QR code you can scan to see more information, but note that the abstract deadline is tomorrow, I think, but it's, it can be extended and full paper submission in May 15th. 
So this is a topic that uh, they are interested. So you can find them and uh, get your, get to check if you, are, if you have something to submit. So feel free to share and at the, at the end of the workshop, feel free to share some feedbacks and comments and some further ideas so that uh, maybe we can do better in the next year for this workshop because uh, uh, building the data set in this field is a long way, not uh, we need more. I will stop share my screen and uh, give the access to our first uh, presenter, I think. Yes, uh, should I start? So, Majid, yes. Mm -hmm. Please. So uh, is it visible now? Yeah, I see your screen. It's uh, yeah, the room. Perfect. It's the room event. Yeah, but you're not your slide. Oh no, 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 no. Oh, it's uh, my fault. Sorry. So yeah, you see my slide now. Yeah, I yes, can see. Yeah, I can see it. It's a PDF. Oh, uh, just uh, is it moving? Do you see the second slide? Not yet. Okay, we are uh, again. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, no, I think it was, yes, yes. It was freezed. Yeah. yeah, sorry for that. It's almost uh, 2 a.m. in the morning. So, uh, yeah, so thank you for that. So, my name is Majid I'm uh, I'm a PhD student at Leighton Institute of Technology. I'm doing my PhD under supervision of Professor Hans Jürgen Zippernick. So today I'm going to present our paper with the title SSV360. It's a data set on subjective quality assessment of 360 degree videos for standing and uh, seated viewing on uh, the head mounted displays. Yeah, so I'll start with uh, some introduction and we go to the experimental setup followed up with the data, uh, data set structure and then give some uh, show the recorded data and uh, conclusions of that. So as can be seen that uh, virtual reality applications um, have become increasingly, in increasingly popular in recent years. Um, for quality assessment tasks, a uh, human rating on the quality are needed to provide the ground truth for such developing some uh, systems or applications on that, for that way. So uh, in this paper, we introduced the uh, SSV 360 degree data set on the subjective quality assessment of 360 degree videos, which provides uh, a, a pilot study on the impact of standing and seated viewing on a head mounted displays and uh, also has a wide range of uh, psychological and uh, uh, psychophysiological data as well. So starting with the experimental setup, so uh, first I show the stimuli. So we have uh, four natural scenes of 10 second duration, as you can see on the, um, the figure. So we have sample frames of the video scenes and equirectangular projection format. So uh, these are the scenes we used. So uh, each scene is originally produced as a 8K resolution as a reference. So from that reference, we produced the 6K and 4K, 2K and the optimal resolution. And the optimal resolution is, is, uh, is customized based on the current headset we use. And from each reference videos, we uh, do some compression with some quantization parameters uh, starting from 22 till 42. So overall, with all these combinations, we have a set of 120 videos for each session. And we have each participant join two sessions and uh, one for standing and one for seated. So, um, 
So uh, the videos were displayed on uh, HTC Vive Pro H, uh, H, uh, HMD. Uh, it has a 110 degree field of view and the refresh rate of 90 Hertz. And the test platform was uh, built using the Unity 3D game engine. In addition, we used the iMotion software and uh, in integrated with the game engine and uh, we record uh, extra uh, data such as the uh, heart rate and GSR data. And also we use the iMotion to build some um, uh, uh, so interface for recording the simulator sickness uh, questionnaire. And uh, for this uh, data set that uh, we recorded for five uh, experts on, uh, on this uh, field, and they are familiar with the uh, immersive multi uh, media and they are two females and three males. So the age of the participants uh, lies in the range of uh, 31 to 60 years old, with the average of 38 years. Um, so all of the participants attended all the full sessions. Uh, they watched the entire 120 videos and uh, on, on the average of 23.43 uh, minutes, including the rating times as well, the rating durations. So the, so the test procedure. So uh, first we started with some introduction and um, we started uh, putting the GSR sensors and doing some setup. And then the participants are start, started uh, recording the, uh, filling the simulator sickness questionnaire, reporting the 16 symptoms before the experiment. And then we started the HMD exposure time where the participants start first with the calibrating the eye tracking and then started uh, seeing the videos. And the videos were represented in a, nor in a random order. And uh, each video followed with some voting uh, I have to, to, to read the, the quality of the video. And uh, at the end of, uh, of the experiment, we, the participants uh, also do the simulator sickness questionnaire again to report uh, if they have some uh, symptoms after the, after the experiment. So, um, so, the, so the data set structure, um, so the data made available for public uh, in this GitHub link with this link. So the data has, um, when you open the link, you have uh, three main folders. So you have the test scenes. So for the test scenes, uh, you have, uh, uh, you will find the 120 videos used for this experiment, even with, with the compressed one. And the other folders for stand, standing viewing and the seated viewing, uh, they contain all the uh, recorded data corresponding to each uh, uh, setup or each session. Uh, so, um, so going to the what we have on the recorded data. So we started with the uh, rating times. So uh, for this uh, figure, we have the volume plots of the rating times for each video scene. And also we have it for as an average of the four scenes. Uh, this is uh, for the whole five participants. So uh, uh, yeah, so as we can see the, the general observation, it's uh, mostly most of the rating uh, are lying under the two seconds. Uh, and uh, with the average, so it's also with the rating times, it's, uh, cannot distinguish between standing and seated. However, the standing has a higher mean compared to seated, but it's still like uh, um, not related much with the, with the uh, as a quality assessment task, but it's a uh, uh, psychological mix. So on the other, uh, the recorded data, which is the opinion scores. And here we have the, uh, the average mean opinion score versus the quantization parameters for each resolution. So basically after each video, we have uh, the participants are encouraged to give a rating between from one to five. One is bad and five is excellent based on the quality they say or they think about it. So as we can see as a general, um, so we see with the 8K, the, it has a higher progression and starts uh, uh, from, uh, higher progression with the high, uh, highest resolution and it's uh, in decreasing as far as you 
increase the quantization parameter. And also this shows that uh, with the eighth gate has a higher average mean opinion scores. For example, if you compare it with the 2K, it's almost uh, higher than um, with the 8K. Um, we, we also have the head movements uh, data for the, uh, for the whole uh, uh, sessions for, for standing and seated. So in this figure, we, we report the cumulative distribution functions of the yo and the pitch and the roll angles for standard and seating uh, for each participant. So as we can see, it's, uh, standing viewing has like participants, since they explored more compared to the seated. And that's also changing between, uh, between participants and based on the participants' behavior on, on the task. And the task was the free exploration and the, the participant can explore any part of the scene they want. And uh, we have also the uh, eye tracking data and the one part of the eye tracking data on this data set is the pupil dilation. So we have, uh, we reported the left and right eye pupil diameters for each participant. And we got here and also, uh, and we have the average uh, across all the participants. So uh, as a general observation, we can say that uh, uh, for the left eye, it's, um, the pupil diameter is much higher than the, the right eye. And uh, actually this subjected to the, the brightness of the scene. And this could be analyzed with this, when we split the scenes. Uh, as you can see the, the, the dilation in uh, the pupil dilation in each eye. And um, yeah, we also have the GCR, the Galvanic Scan Response, which uh, reports the emotional erosion on, uh, for the participants during the exposure of the, exp uh, the hit uh, during the HMD exposure time. So we have also for standard standing and seated viewing for all the participants. And we can see that also there is a difference between standard, standing and seated. And also that changes from participant to participants, of course. And uh, uh, yes, and this is the amplitudes in micro siemens. So there are also extra parameters on the data sets uh, you can uh, explore, uh, it, can, it could be explored more. And uh, so, yeah, and finally, so this is the simulator question uh, scores. So uh, each participant uh, ha has to answer 60, to report 16 symptoms. And if you can see the pre SSQ, so there is no much difference between standing and seated, and almost the symptoms are very low compared to the post SSQ, if we can see. So, and uh, standing seems uh, has a higher uh, symptoms compared to the seated for the uh, general discomfort and fatigue and nausea and uh, vertigo and some other symptoms compared to the seated, which is also has some higher uh, symptoms compared to the uh, pre SSQ. So, uh, yeah, so this is so in general, like um, to conclude this uh, presentation. So we have uh, presented the uh, annotated uh, SSV360 data set that has been uh, made public available on the, on the GitHub now. Uh, so the data set contains uh, the psychological and uh, physical uh, psychological data of five participants. Uh, that's also recorded for the pilot study on effect of uh, standing and seated viewing on the quality assessment task. So the recorded data, as mentioned, that includes the rating times, opinion scores, the head movement, pupil duration, complex scan response, and the SSQ. And uh, so the future work, so this the ground truth of the data uh, provided in this data set may be uh, used to support the human-centered and the perception-based uh, assist, uh, assessment immersive uh, media processing algorithms. And our future work includes that uh, we conduct subjective tests 
on the same manner, but uh, uh, with a large set of uh, viewing, different viewing conditions, in addition to the standing and seated also. Uh, yeah, so this work is funded by Knowledge Foundation in Sweden with, through the Viatic project, and we thank the volunteers for their time. And uh, thank you all. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, please. I cannot hear you. You're muted. Uh, I still cannot hear. Sorry, no, I was not. I was not uh, talking. I was just writing a question in Discord, but I'm not sure whether we need to wait until all the papers have been presented for the how it's how are we gonna proceed, Jan? Are you Jan? I think you're muted, uh, Jan. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, so fine. we have one question. We have one question from uh, Nikki. Do the three six zero degree video have videos have audio? If not, will the effect of audio cues be part of your future research? Yeah. So thank you for the question. Um, well, and uh, on this so uh, for the for the stimuli we used, so they are there is no audio on, on the scene. So uh, of course, I agree that uh, it could have some effect, of course, as an attention on that, but we decided first in order to just be focused as a quality task. So this is the goal of the participants. They have just to, 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 uh, to judge on the, on the, on the quality of, of, of the scene itself. So, and uh, yeah, we, we could be have some uh, other stimuli in future, including some, uh, some uh, audio because it will uh, um, have some effect on that. Uh, you have, for example, participants could go to the source and uh, focus on, on that part compared to the other things. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. And also the okay. second question from Estelle, she asks, uh, are you planning to increase the number of subjects? Yes. Uh, currently, yeah. I say you have totally only five participants, right? Yeah, we have five participants, but uh, yeah, we have a plan to increase the participants, of course. And the, the reason is uh, five participants because of the pandemic and we couldn't uh, recruit more participants because of the restrictions and the, we, the tools and the headset and all these things. So this was one of the bottlenecks, I would say. And, uh, in, but uh, including also the task itself is a bit heavy. It's a lot of uh, stimuli, like 120 stimuli for, for each session, which is quite, um, quite a big number in terms of the quality assessment tasks. So, uh, but yes, of course, so we have a plan for increasing and we have other data sets. Actually, it has more participants, but we are under progress uh, right now. So probably soon at some point we can have it as well. Hmm? Okay, thank you. And also we have a question from Vincent. Uh, but hmm. So how you find some correlation between the head movement and the uh, sickness and also the correlation between purple diameter and sickness? Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. Yes, we find this, uh, uh, it's not reported actually on, 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 this, uh, on, the, on, this, uh, on this paper. 
but we we are doing some studies. Uh, we did some individual studies for the head movements and uh, for simulator sequence questionnaire, and we found some correlations. And uh, we we uh, and that bring brought us uh, some extra questions about um, if we keep uh, r repeating all this. Uh, for, for the same participants, will we have the same correlations or not? And that's what we currently doing. And uh, like each participant also repeated, repeated all these sessions again. And um, yeah, so there is a correlation, but uh, we, uh, we didn't do that yet with the opinion scores. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So Estelle has another question. So maybe you can ask, you can answer later. Actually, yeah, we have to move to the second oh, presenter. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. um, so it, we next presenter is Timbal Bo Bonha, a data set and a methodology for self effacing uh, feeling prediction during industry 4.0 VR activity. So. If you, if you are here, you can share your screen. Okay, thanks. We see, we yeah. see your screen Do you see now. my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, is it moving? Okay. Yeah, it's moving, yes. Okay, so um, today I'm going to present you um, Eraser. A data set and methodology for self efficacy feeling prediction during industry from port or virtual reality activity. So, first, as you probably know, virtual reality is widely used in industry 4.0 in product and process design, human robot collaboration, maintenance, and knowledge dissemination. On the right, we can see a digital twin of an assembly line used by student to learn lean manufacturing. So education and training can take advantage of uh, virtual reality. So learning tasks are improved with reduced uh, learning, uh, learning time and boosted performance. It also improves knowledge retention and engagement over a design task. So we see on what depends the learning performance and um, from article, we've seen that learning performance directly depends on the engagement of the learner. And this engagement relies on three things, value activity, self-regulation, and self-efficacy. So on this paper, we are focusing on self-efficacy, which is defined as uh, the judgment of the learner on their capacity to succeed in the task. So it comes from four principles, uh, sources, mastery of experience, substitution of experience, verbal persuasion, and emotional arousal. So it has been proven in the past that emotion are induced by a uh, physiological state of the person, which can be measured by a broad range of, uh, broad range of uh, sensor in an objective way. So there have been uh, previous study undergone related to physiological uh, data, some in the context of virtual reality, some not. Um, different social combination have been used either to measure uh, mental workload, fear of eight, and cyber sickness. It also exists several public data sets tracking physiological data and its human behavior counterpart. For example, we have the DAP and the seed for emotion recognition. Uh, seed uh, VIG for visualist estimation, Wayside and SU for uh, respective, respectively uh, stress and workload assessment. So, study so found that a virtual reality learning environment uh, provide valuable learning insight for the trainee with high self efficacy. So, all work fall um, within a field field uh, where there is no real public data set is or for industrial case for our learning case focusing on a more macro approach like um, self-efficacy with physical sensor. So moreover, uh, education and formation can take 
the most of the easily molding uh, reality environment, virtual reality environment, uh, to adapt the learning process to the learner. So that's the final goal of our work to create an intelligent tutoring system. So the motivation is to adapt the learning to the learner by predicting his perceived self-efficacy and subsequently adapt the virtual reality environment. Uh, the second motivation is to develop insight on the, so on the different uh, sensors uh, and the future use for such a tutoring system. So we hence propose a data set to classify perceived self-efficacy during, during virtual reality activity by the analysis of physiological sensor. So the first phase is the data set acquisition. Uh, we use several sensors, electroencephalogram, electrocardiogram, galvanic skin response, and eye tracking. So the trainee is in a virtual learning environment where he's learning assembly task. And there he, he reports, his he, he self-report is self-efficacy. And also that are gathered with a uh, emotion platform, which aggregate uh, and synchronize all the signals. So first, we will present the virtual learning environment, uh, the protocol, the content of the data set, and to finish by the validation of full data by classification with a multivariate LSTM network. So the learning environment consists in a digital twin of an industrial uh, assembly process. It is developed with Unity and allow to produce different uh, lean manufacturing scenario to simulate assembly tasks. So it has been modified to allow the collection of sensors through uh, the emotion platform. And we can see on the bottom, uh, also synchronized uh, signal, for example, eye tracking. And we have also EEG here and a bit of GS here. So for the protocol, given an instruction sheet, uh, participants have to consequently uh, follow the directive in order to assemble the component together. So this is a bike assembly line, and each workstation uh, is a step of the assembly. So for each stage situation on a workstation, the participant consult the instruction sheet, then write their perceived self-efficacy about the situation. So, and next, the, the participant carry out the activity by following the assembly step, and at the end, he self-report again his self-efficacy on a scale of one to 10. So, as our goal is to collect a wide range of perceived self-efficacy, we need different level of tasks. So, we wanted to put the participant in situation where they could face some difficulty and therefore perceive different self-efficacy. And we end gather uh, different instruction sheets and um, we group them and some detailed assembly have been gathered into one uh, assembly sheet. As you can see with the blue one uh, that have been summed in the green one to have a more complex case with all the steps together. So the data set consists in five surgical recording from uh, EEG, ECG, GSR, and ET sensor, and uh, the reported self-efficacy. So each sensor provides a wide set of features, raw signal, and some calculated by the acquisition platform emotion. For example, we have EEG sensor, which provides three sets of features. We have raw EEG, decontaminated EEG and uh, brain set matrix. For example, decontaminated channels uh, comes from an algorithm that remove, uh, removed uh, artifacts like ocular movement and saturation. And for example, EC, from the ECG sensor, we have the raw channels, the filtered one, and the earth rate calculated by emotion. So to sum up, we have um, 15 participants uh, which perform the data collection and a total of 890 minutes have been recorded for uh, 406 passive self-efficacy with a mean self-efficacy of 7.5. As the mean term objective 
is to adapt the virtual reality scenario according to the self-efficacy prediction. We decided to check the feasibility of the self-efficacy pre self efficacy prediction by validating our data set with a, a deep learning classification arch architecture. So first we will see the data processing step. So we have resample of the signal by uh, 128 hertz. And we'll, as each sensor uh, has multiple set of features, we decided to evaluate all the combination of the six features um, in order to earn insight about the feature importance. So a total of, six, of 63 models have been tried. Uh, with, for example, model one as a combination of uh, eye tracking and, um, and uh, ECG. For the data selection, we suppose that five recall data were more indicative of the self-efficacy after the consultation of the assembly task sheet. Uh, when the person is fully aware of uh, the different steps that they need to do, and when the assembly is finished also. So we only select the two, la the last two seconds of the, before the answer. And uh, we also do, well, we also did um, window overlapping and we ends, uh, get uh, a lot more uh, samples. Then we are ready for uh, classification. So as our target value is um, the self-efficacy, which is a discrete value between one and 10, we decided to do a binary classification as our interest is to know if the person feels competent or no. And we take the median value. So we compute the average of the accuracy across fivefold using an architecture coming from an article from Fazal Karim. Uh, which is a mix of convolutional and LSTM block with uh, some squeeze and extension block. So they adaptively rescale the input feature. Uh, and it's not our feature. Uh, I have uh, the same impact on the su subsequent layer, which is really important in multivariate time series as are not as not our feature have the same importance. So classification has been done uh, without any hyperparameter optimization. We just only take uh, the hyperparameter from the article. And the best accuracy without augmentation is model two, with uh, 73% by the combination of EEG decontaminated ET and ECG filter set. And uh, with window overlapping, we get an accuracy of six, of fifth, of, Sorry, of 77.8% uh, uh, with only ET sensor and ECG sensor. Uh, so window overlapping is highly beneficial for this combination as it improved by more than uh, 10%. So ET analysis feature set does not seem to improve the accuracy, whereas ECG and ET seems to be very informative as it's always in the best combination. This underlies a problem, the so cross of dimensionality, especially is multivariate time series. Uh, accuracy is better using only a subset of features uh, because there are features that may have a low reliability or a low signal to noise. So our work is available on GitHub from the data to, from the, data to the processing scripts and classification scripts. So as well, the proposed work is to model learner self-efficacy by adapting the virtual learning environment to the learner based on boundary principles. Um, we have promising results that can be extended uh, by further work, uh, for example, with uh, multi-class classification uh, or uh, regression. Uh, we may also work on our data for example, data slicing, slicing or data augmentation technique uh, or uh, other um, with some feature engineering, for example, frequency-based model. Uh, but we can also work on model size for, with uh, other architecture. So that's it. If you have 
Any okay, thanks, uh, thanks for the uh, upstanding presentation of T-Bot, especially I see in the beginning, you have a very good uh, state of the art. Uh, you presented many useful data sets, existing data set to us. And uh, so, yes, we have one question from Estelle. She asks us, what is the size of your input layer? And is it unidimensional data? I think it's related to your um, no, it's not. SDM architecture, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So it depends on the model because we build, oh, sorry, I'm listening me, sorry. So uh, it depends on the model because um, each model have different number of features. So the input layer will be different. For example, uh, with uh, the model one with ET and ECG sensor, we'll have, for example, 18 features. And, uh, but uh, my question is whether it's example, just uh, like one dimensional Tibao, it's not images in any case, right? So it's just a time series of numbers. It's a time series. Multi multivariate time series. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we can oh. build model on uh, univariate or multivariate. Okay. Yeah, but this one. And this model is for multivariate. Yeah, yeah. This. Mm, okay. 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 Hey, thanks. And, the, and the we're going to have. So shall we to complete the, the Thibault's answers because we worked together on this this uh, this publication uh, for each uh, sensor like EEG you as we can see on the on the table you, you get nine features so it's nine features that are reported it's time series that are reported and gathered in high motion platforms so you get a lot of time series. And the idea was to test some different uh, combination of models. So you, you test if the combination with EEG and GSRs can predict the, the self-efficacy feeling. You test if EEG and eye tracking together can better predict the, the self-efficacy feeling and so on. And the idea is to find the best combination and also perhaps to find the best combination without the EEG because the EEG is quite cumbersome to, to install on people. And finally, the idea is to know the self-efficacy feeling of the person and therefore to adapt the VR scenario. If we, we, we can detect that the person uh, got a low self-efficacy feeling, we can adapt the scenario and put some uh, advice inside the scenario to, to make it feel better, to better learn his task. So the, the, the idea for this thing. So the MLSTM is really, you put several time series as a, an input and the MLSTM can predict the self-efficacy feeling thanks to this series of uh, time series uh, data. Okay, so thanks. Thanks for the answer. And uh, we have to move to the third presenter, uh, Estelle. Yes, can I share my, my... Yes, yes, you can share your screen now. I stopped, okay. so you can share something. Okay, so let me see. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's see if I can. Can you see if I put it in the entire screen? Yes, I can see. Yeah. And also, you can see now if I'm moving. Yes, yeah, it's moving. Yes, it's moving. Okay, okay. so good uh, morning, afternoon, night to everybody. Um, so, I'm going to present on behalf of my team the work entitled Real Time Egocentric Object Segmentation. And it's, it's in terms of data that we use, it is based on Thury labeling, which was an egocentric data set that was already available in the literature. 
but do not have the particular ground truths that we require. I will explain this uh, through the presentation. And uh, we are like a extended reality group who is working in, in Nokia and we are physically placed in Madrid. So if you ever come, don't hesitate to contact me and to visit our laboratories. You will have a lot of fun. So uh, our particular line of research within our team is it's augmented virtuality and now it's also called mixed reality, extended reality. Our idea is try to augment a virtual world or a 360 degree video by some portion of your reality, right? So this portion of, of your reality, it's been acquired by cameras that are attached in front of the VR goggles in case they do not have it, but there are also some VR headsets that already have uh, visible cameras. Um, so the point is that um, we can get different benefits depending on what we segment, okay? So if we're able to segment uh, user hands or even the entire body, uh, there's some previous work that um, that states that we can increase the sense of presence, you know, and normally the state of the art is more based on avatars, but there, there's also room for improvement to understand what are the user preferences in terms of their own representation. And it may also differ depending on the user or depending on the use case. And if we, if we decided to bring to the mixed reality application real objects, then that would allow the user in the immersive experience to interact with objects while being immersed. Imagine that we are, that we are in Virbella, right? And we are attending a, a poster session and you may want to take notes while talking with the presenter. So that would be kind of possible with this line of research, which is still, I mean, ongoing. This is like a, sorry, um, this is like a visual example so that you can understand what I'm talking about. Okay, on the left side, this uh, the merging of some local reality, which is uh, on the right depicted. This is our office and our colleague Nacho. And the resulting is like the mixture between a 360 degree video um, and the portion of the reality in which you are interested. In this case, it's just your, your hands, your limbs and some food. Uh, this was our first prototype in this line of research. And as you can see, it's not a coincidence that all the, that all the objects are sharing like the reddish color. This was because we were using a very simple color-based algorithm to filter what we want, okay? So um, indeed there are different previous work in the, in the literature who have tackled this problem of, of trying to bring some some objects into the VR uh, scenario, and all of them have uh, their pros and then cons, right? So with the color, you can get real-time performance because it's, it's very shallow, but then you come with a lot of constraints regarding the appearance of the environment where you are. And then uh, if you use depth-based uh, methods, um, you have to rely on a particular predefined distance and maybe your scenario needs more flexibility on, on the definition of, of the things that you want to segment. Plus the fact that uh, sensor uh, of this right now cannot accurately estimate death in real time. I mean, there are good sensors, but not bringing enough quality at pixel level. That's why we came up uh, some years ago with the idea of tackling this problem with deep learning. And when we start exploring it, we realized that uh, the data set that were available for semantic segmentation, which is the type of computer vision problem who, uh, suitable for, for this segmentation, uh, they do not either, they were not enough egocentric data set with images from the human body, okay, from a first point of view perfect perspective. But if they were, the problem was that they were not providing the ground truth that we need, which was a pixel wise label. That's why in our beginning of line of research, we propose a semi synthetic data set that you can get uh, information in the paper above. I, I will try to go. Uh, quickly so that I do not spend a lot of time. So we were doing some experiments um, and realized that 
the data was working, but up to a point, we also realized that if we really want our algorithm to work in real life settings, we need also to incorporate real data. So we uh, start looking into the state of the art of the data set and we more or less understood that there were these three different egocentric data set involving uh, user hands and sometimes objects. Two of them were having, well, in all of them, they were also having death and we were also, interesting on, on having data set with this information because uh, for our future line of research, maybe we want to explore the combination of deep learning and depth. So among the different data sets that, that they were available, we chose the Thurit one because that was the one like more, mm, more vari variable in terms of actions, scenarios, and also because it provides like raw data of the depth. This was not the case with EgoGester. And the problem with the, with the FPHH dataset was that the, there were some mock-up uh, hardware in the, in the hands and we do not like this. So um, briefly introducing the theory dataset, this was a dataset that was originally created for action recognition. That's why it is defined in terms of actions. It is, uh, um, the, those actions were done by a user um, several times, right? Um, and with, with this setup that you can see here in the, in the image. Images were videos. Videos were acquired at webcam resolution, which was good enough, I would say. So this is like a, I'm not sure this is a video as well. This is like a, a general video where you can see the, the variation of videos that they were. So, so what we did was to create a, a, a sample of, of, a representative sample of the theory data set by sampling the videos. We were gathering frame from all the videos, from all the user, or from all the repetition, but just a couple of, I would say five to 10 frames per video. And we were using also uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk for the labeling purposes. Uh, to this aim, we create this API, uh, um, software piece to guide the users into the labeling task because we really we really need this segmentation ground truth to be reliable enough so that then we can fit the algorithm. Uh, just as a side note, using Amazon Mechanical Turk for this type of thing, it can save us time, but still it would always require supervision time, you know, which is also energy consuming and time consuming, but it, it's, it's like a trade-off uh, that prevents you from doing the very hard work. This is the part of the supervision that we were doing, right? Because for instance, as you can see here in the top bottom, some people were not really understanding what they need to do and they were doing this. So with the Amazon Mechanical Tour, we have the possibility to reject a result if it was not according to what we have asked and ask the user to do it again. Um, yes, just like practical information, we were paying reasonably good. That's why we, we were able to perform the segmentation in a, in a low um, amount of time. Okay, but still super, supervision was necessary. So we were doing, we were then creating a Python program to double check that the labeling that we have here in the legend was according to what they were supposed to do. So as a result, we have these uh, additional ground truths from, for the Thurit, which is for, for semantic segmentation purposes. And we define the ground truths in three different versions. The original one, where there's always the class of the, of the human body, and then one class per different object. There were around 30 object categor categories. Then another version in which all the objects were considered as the same category. Okay, this, this may be useful for us uh, in the future in case we want to perform a segmentation algorithm where we do not want to specify the particular object because maybe we want to analyze how good the algorithm it is in terms of generalization for other objects not included in the data set. And finally, this do read same class where everything that belong to the foreground was considered part of the same class. 
so once we have these these data set label, we proceed to to train not from scratch but applying transfer learning techniques to a very shallow semantic segmentation network, which is called Thundernet. It was already available in the in the state of the art, but we performed uh, several slightly modification in terms of sizes of the pyramid pooling models. Um, we introduced further skip connections to to help better help the the network to re, to refine the boundaries of the of the edges um well we trained it uh, for um, the details of the training you can find in the paper okay because i don't remember i do not want to lie <laughs> uh, so here there are some preliminary results in terms of the different data set that we were using so of course background is always good for the human body, uh, more or less, we achieve like result in the same in the same range. But when it comes to to the definition of objects, for the original dataset where we were considering uh, every object as a single class, of course, the mean intersection over union, which is the empirical metric that that we used to to compare, was lower than in the second case where all the objects were considered the same class. This might be due to different reasons also because the number of, of images per class is it may be not enough so that the so that the algorithm can really understand and generalize. Um, well this is mainly the case. And for all cases the inference time was the same because we were not changing the architecture. Uh, so uh, in general conclusions, we, we observe that we get good results for big objects or isolated objects. We do not um, um, overlap that much with the human body. Um, poor results, sorry, for small objects, this is a mistake. For instance, the night clipper or the pen this is like very tricky also because when you are using a deep learning network in the encodings of network you are reducing the spatial size of the of the image so it may be that once you arrive to the pool inside module the pixels which belongs to the to these small objects are uh, have almost disappeared so that can fairly um, partially explain this this reasoning and here we have some um, qualitative results so you you can see how good the algorithm is doing depending on the on the data set that was used for training and this is the second column is the ground truth and also you know this is done as a previous step so that then we can integrate this algorithm into a mixed reality application where you can see your own body okay so this this is why we also introduced this image, so, so you have an idea of what we are, of what we are uh, aiming. Um, so this is like kind of work in progress, uh, but the reality is that then after this, uh, we also decided to create our own data set. This is uh, still not available, but we plan to make it available as, as well. In this case, we were using two different type of dev sensors, both were from Intel, but one was using uh, infrared based technology and the other one was a LiDAR sensor. Um, we were also, you know, because our use case were more uh, particular for office use case or for industrial use case, and the objects that were present in the thread do not really represent our scenarios. That's why that was one of the main motivation for doing it. And just for for finishing, you know, like the future work is already a reality, and we have also presented it as a poster in the regular conference. So. Uh, at the end, we have money to train an algorithm based on this architecture um, in terms of data, based on a combination of the two read labeling plus this new data set that we have created that is able to segment your own real body in the wild condition, as you can see here. And for this, for this to, to really showcase the, the potential of this, we, we write this paper 
and we we develop a gamify experience so that the user has to feel as if he's going across a, a bridge, a very narrow bridge uh, on top of the crater of a volcano. So we have two related posters related to this technology. So if you want to know more detail about, you can also visit us next Tuesday, uh, March for European time will be Monday, Monday at night. Uh, at night. Yes. So that's all from my side. Thank you for for listening to me. And I hope you find this work useful. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Astella, thanks for the presentation. And uh, yes, uh, we, I have one question about uh, the AI new about uh, the uh, AI network. How did you try other AI structure? I mean, I mean, how did you determine it's the best, uh, you can get the best performance I mean, with the current uh, structure, yeah. The deep learning network. Well, this is also come from previous work that we have done. When we start approaching this problem, we use other type of semantic segmentation network which were from state of the art back then. They were called mm -hmm. deep, lab, deep Lab versus three, okay? The problem that okay. we face with this network architecture is that their inference time was so big that we could not use it for real time purposes. And one heavy requirement that we have for our use case, which is to integrate with this reality application is that they need to work in real time. That's why we need uh, a shallow network, a shallower network. That's why we move from this previous one to ThunderNet. Okay. Okay, so we don't have questions from the Discord. So um, I think I've got time. one question for the Stella. Okay. Question. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, go ahead. Yes, it's a great presentation. Um, yeah. have you have you tested uh, to to get some data from VR uh, experimentation? And so inside VR you can have a segmentation of all the object and, and the end and so on. So you can have some ground truth segmentation uh, right by doing it in VR. And after to test if it can uh, generalize well on real data. Do you mean uh, use um, synthetic data that you can get from yeah. Unity, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. the, we know about this possibility, but we have not explored it yet. I have yeah. my concerns in regarding this because even if you make them as realistic as possible, it still said there would be a, a gap in terms of appearance yeah. between between the three D models of the objects you want to model and the real objects. I would say that it could help as a part of the entire data set that you use to train, but not exclusively relying it on it. Yeah, perhaps a mix of, of both. That also worked for our case. You know that in the beginning of my presentation, I was mentioning this semi-synthetic data set that we start, that we did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we realized that this was not good enough. At the end, it helps. It helped us because maybe we did not have enough data for lower bodies. And all, but mm -hmm. it it's, it's not... Uh, its general generalization capabilities is not good enough to work okay. isolated, you know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So we we move to the next presenter, Chen Yang. So please share your screen now. Okay. Okay. Can you all see uh, my my screen? Yes, it's the 15th slide. Yes. OK, OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes. Uh, my name is Yang Chen. Uh, I come from Hopi University of Technology. I'm uh, so excited to share my research uh, with you. Uh, uh, this title is about uh, identification of key features for VR applications we re review, the topic model approach. And uh, Recently, the metaverse have gained great attention from both academic and industry. In consumer markets, uh, where applications have become 
uh, very popular due to their entertainment and uh, uh, enjoyment. Uh, for example, uh, according to the uh, reports re uh, released by the Harvard Business Review in uh, 2021, uh, um, those, those blogs uh, online uh, working game platform have 37 million daily active users and uh, 20 million multiplayer games. Uh, we find an intro, uh, in, interesting phenomenon uh, that uh, some web applications after they are released achieve good sales in markets, and where, uh, whereas other attracts uh, much less attention. So uh, in this paper, we attempt to analyze the reasons for this phenomenon uh, uh, by mining key features for web, uh, web applications. And uh, uh, we know many, pre uh, many previous studies have focused on the feature extraction on products and uh, can be classified uh, into three uh, categories from the perspective of the data. Uh, the first is about uh, product descriptions, and the second is about user item interactions, such as purchase records. And the third is your generated content, such as online reviews or tags. Uh, so this paper aims to uh, identify uh, interpretable product feature comment in, uh, in reviews. Uh, and the commonly, uh, uh, commonly used method to obtain the product feature uh, is to use conventional top model uh, uh, like uh, uh, LDA and MF, uh, uh, and MF methods uh, are typically uh, measures. Uh, uh, in order to uh, obtain the interpretable features, uh, in, this, uh, in this paper we uh, we choose the top model for uh, for, for our task. Uh, so our motivation uh, is to explore the VR application features perceived by consumers, and uh, identification of key features for VR application will help uh, uh, optimize user experience in V2 environments. Uh, However, uh, because of uh, uh, because of factors of consumer reviews, uh, mining the key feature uh, may face uh, two challenges. The first challenge uh, is the review of VR application uh, include massive general or noise information, uh, such as the background word and the non feature words. And this noise information may uh, lead to poor quality in mining features. The second challenge is the limited feature, limited feature discussed in its review. Uh, for example, uh, a, ga a gamer of uh, a VR game often mentions only a few features in their comments, such as uh, uh, entertainment uh, and phone. Mot uh, mo uh, motivated by these two challenges, we present a general and sparse topic model uh, for mining uh, the features, the key features. Uh, and we wanted to uh, derive useful insight uh, into VR application design and implement. And this slide, this slide shows uh, the, graph, uh, the graphical representation of our proposed model. Uh, in this model, uh, we assume its review of a VR application can be viewed as a mixture of a limited of a specific topic and a general topic. Uh, thus, we, uh, we, in this model, we uh, introduce uh, a basin prior. Uh, this, this prior is called spike and uh, uh, slab prior. Uh, this prior allows uh, its review describes narrow range of topic related to VR application. And uh, to determine whether a word in each review is a feature related word or a general word, we also introduce a binary variables from Bernoulli distribution. And for our model inference, uh, we select a, a Gibbs sampling method for the model inference. Uh, first, we simply, uh, we, we simply the topic selector uh, to determine uh, which topic or feature occur uh, in a review. And a, se uh, and a second, uh, uh, we, uh, we simple uh, the topic assignments and to determine 
uh, each word belong to which topic or feature. And third, we, we simple the binary values in our model to determine which words belong to the, uh, uh, to the general topic. And based on our model, uh, we can uh, estimate the Latin, uh, three Latin parameters. Uh, the first is uh, about the topic distribution for each review. And the second is the specific topic distribution. The third is uh, uh, general topic distribution. For our, uh, for our data, we use Oculus as our empirical application. And it is one of the most representative uh, VR application platforms. Uh, and the data set can be downloaded from our GitHub. And also we provide uh, our, uh, uh, our code uh, for the model. Uh, the strength of this platform uh, is that only consumers who have purchased uh, and experienced uh, VR games uh, can give comments, which ensure the credibility of the data. And this table shows this table shows the summary of our final data sets uh, after after our uh, pre-processing. We remove the, uh, the uh, remove the privacy uh, information from the data. Uh, uh, we note uh, we note our uh, our data set contains uh, large scale consumers and uh, reviews. And we implement uh, our method uh, using Java. Uh, due to the space uh, limita uh, limitation, we just uh, uh, present uh, uh, fifteen topics and and label the uh, la label these topics from the topic results. Uh, we, we note that our model can identify distinct uh, and meaningful topics. We find a series, a set of uh, uh, VR features uh, that are uh, often mentioned in consumer reviews, uh, such as uh, entertainment and for challenges, colorful movement and space, uh, emo uh, emergency, uh, price, uh, escape, uh, user, uh, usability, chat and social uh, uh, sickness. Uh, and, I, uh, and we all know uh, it's we uh, are application contains a, a set of uh, reviews. Uh, we also uh, use empirical estimation by integrating the topic distribution of our review of a VR application to analyze the feature distribution for VR application. We give two examples uh, uh, in, in our paper. The first uh, example is uh, the VR application perfect. Uh, uh, and this application provide, provides beautiful location for gamers. Uh, and we note from our results uh, that uh, game, uh, gamers often talk about uh, uh, topic uh, uh, 27. Uh, and this topic is, describes, uh, this, uh, is describing the application feature of laser and reflection. Uh, the, sec uh, the second application uh, in, our, uh, in our example is about the journey across the solar system. Uh, and we note uh, gamers often talk about the application feature of escape and emerging. Uh, also, uh, we use uh, uh, TSNE method to uh, visualize uh, these reviews by uh, a 2D map. Uh, we, we note that the reviews with similar topic distribution uh, are clustered into the same groups, uh, which proves the feature highly in the reviews learned by our proposed model are highly interpretable. Uh, 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 okay, uh, let me summarize uh, this paper. Uh, first, we develop a, a topic model. Uh, it's a, a test mining um, approach uh, to automatically identify the key features of VR application uh, from your reviews. Uh, and the second, with our results, uh, we find that the proposed model can identify a set of meaningful features related to VR uh, applications. And third, we present a novel data set about, uh, uh, about uh, VR application uh, for the future work. Uh, first, we can explore the evolution, and, uh, evolution method to validate our, pro our approach for informing VR application feature. Uh, and second, uh, we can uh, use these features as input to uh, analyze consumer performance and uh, uh, recommend VR applications. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, thanks for Dr. Chen and uh, the presentation is very great. So actually I, I, I want, I'm one of the author for this uh, for this work. I know the work is more about the e-commerce, so it's different to the previous presented article papers. In, in for the other three, they more like uh, user int computer human inter interaction in mixed reality field. But this paper is more like uh, for the users for the for e-commerce, for some comments, we have we will firstly find some comments from the public public uh, app store. So we download them and analyze analyze some features of these VR apps. So we with this result, we guide the consumers. To, we cannot we we know how how which features are important for the consumers. So it will be very useful for developer for VR developers to know the result of this work. So, so thanks for the presentation. So I think the next, if we, we don't have currently, okay, we may have one question from the Daniel. Okay, so one question for Chenyang. Do you have any early conclusions about which features are important for successful VR apps based on your analysis? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, we can introduce more data, uh, more data to uh, anal analyze the successful of uh, VR applications, uh, such as ratings. Uh, in our, uh, in uh, the current data sets, we just provide uh, the user and uh, the uh, VR applications interactions in our data set. Uh, we don't, uh, also, uh, we also we provide, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I, I don't remember it. Uh, uh, maybe uh, in our data sets, we provide the ratings, uh, the ratings of uh, uh, of uh, user commented the uh, web applic application. Okay. Okay. So next, uh, we will welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Prof. Pan Hui. He is uh, an international fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, an IEEE fellow, an ACM distinguished scientist, and also a member of the Academy of Europe. So he will give us his uh, vision about the, the future metaverse. So Prof. Pan Hui, here's yours. Okay, hi, hi. Thanks, uh, Yuan, for the introduction and uh, also the invitation. So. Yeah, good morning and afternoon or evening to every to to to, to everyone. So uh okay, let me share my slide. Uh oh you have disabled the uh slide sharing. You and you you may need to uh uh it seems I cannot share slides. Oh why? I let me put you as a co-host. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Are you now? Oh, now I can. Yeah, yeah. Now I can do the. Okay, slide. okay. Great. I think you have to. Yeah. Okay. So, can you see my slide now? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, yeah, so thanks uh, for the uh, introduction about the title. So today I'm uh, you know, going to talk actually not really uh, something uh, research. But you know, uh, I'm going to talk about some technology that you know uh, require for this uh, metaverse. So you have been a uh, you know, uh, you know, quite popular keyword like for the last one year or so, and uh, so I'm going to talk about what uh, kind of you know, uh, you may treat more kind of survey or you know summary of what have already done in the you know in the past, and you know what kind of direction that we may want to do in the future. So I, you know, I can see that all of you uh, here are, you know, expert in uh, VR or probably also AR as well. So I would pick some points which are more relevant, you know, uh, that you are not so familiar to talk about. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is actually the title is called the the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Metaverse. So basically, we all thinking, you know, we have uh, many of us probably already read this paper, uh, this book, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So basically. Yeah, we, we borrow the name from there and uh, I hope that, you know, people like it. So in the background, so this is actually uh, based on uh, uh, quite a lot of the material is based on our survey paper uh, we written uh, October last year. And 
was actually pretty, you know, it is pretty popular and we got about uh, 60,000 read already on research gay. And uh, we thought, you know, maybe it's good to, to share with you, uh, you guys as well. So, you know, we also have some slide for today. So if you are interested to read the slide, uh, you know, later, so you can also download the slide with the QR code on this PPT here. You can also download them from my webpage. So you, uh, so the slide are available. Most of the slide are available over there. Uh, right. So thanks. Then, uh, so what is the metaverse, right? So we have been, you know, uh, I I think in the VR community or in the uh, ISMA community or in in the uh, uh, different, you know, uh, human. Uh, computer interaction related community, people have discussed, have different opinions. So there's, you know, obviously one, one vision from the, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or from the more VR aspect is that, you know, the metaverse is a totally virtual war, right? That is, you know, it's similar to the vision from the snow crash. It's a science fiction snow crash from Neil Stephenson in, uh, from 1992, right? That, uh, is a totally virtual world that people, uh, in the individual, when they put on their goggle, they go into the virtual world, and then they will be able to interact uh, and doing business in this uh, metaverse. Of course, there are also another vision from uh, more on the augmented reality point of view. The people that they are, they imagine this uh, this metaverse as a, a merging of the real and the, the reality and the you know and the uh, the, the virtual object and the uh, the reality right so you, we we i have also described in my f chat that you know uh, the ar people imagine the metaverse as um, uh, you know uh, very uh, nice immersive blending of the virtual object into the real environment so basically you cannot tell what is actually the real and what's unreal right so there's two two versions but you know i think both of them will be involved parallelly and maybe join at some, uh, you know, at some point, right? So then uh, we have this, uh, the cat at the end of Metaverse. So basically, you guys still remember that uh, at the beginning of the internet, maybe 2000, so this is a picture from the New York car, right? That, you know, on the internet, nobody knows that you are a dog. So basically, it's kind of telling that now we have a democracy or a democratization of the internet, right? So everybody be able to use the internet. So then we also put this uh, this kind of uh, slogan or, or also like here, right? We have a cat. So in the metaverse, you can be a cat. So basically, they uh, kind of saying that in the new metaverse, that everybody can choose another identity and be able to live, you know, uh, with another identity. With the, you know, you can be a cat. You can live like cat, behave like cat, and talk to other people like cat, right? In this uh, metaverse. So the uh, VR virtual reality and uh, VR consortium, I think I'm not going to talk about it. It's as guys, you are very familiar with. So then, but we talk about the building the metaverse, right? So they say that we are going to build a, a virtual uh, VR um, metaverse. So we, at the moment we just, you know, ignore the, 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 the AR version first, right? So they say we, we build a, a VR type of metaverse. So what should we do, right? So uh, there are three phases, uh, basically, uh, from, uh, you know, from the study, right, that, you know, uh, from the literature and also from what we have uh, believe ourselves. So you have kind of, kind of three phases. One phase is, okay, we, we call it the digital twin, right? So basically you do a 3D model, you do a modeling of the real world and then you, you, you put in uh, the, 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 the virtual model and the real world tied together with the data, right? So you have data exchange between the virtual thing and the, uh, the real things, right? So this is uh, one of these uh, vision about the uh, digital twin. And the digital twin is, uh, is a basic step because it, 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 you know, the virtual thing is also exists in the real, real world, right? So you just have, um, you, you kind of having a model of the real the physical world, okay? But what about the second step is about the, um, something called digital native. What about the, uh, you know, in the virtual world, there can be some of this entity, uh, actually a lot of identity that may not uh, exist in the real world, right? So they can be an uh, uh, art piece created by the artist. They can be some content generated by the others, uh, users. So they can be, uh, you know, houses built, which are not exist in the real world. So we call this thing called digital native. So they are native in the, the, in the digital space. And then of course this is actually uh, now we got also the uh, 
VR here as, uh, as well. So we've got the uh, coexist of physical and virtual reality. So basically the version is about, you know, when things are built in the, uh, the, the, the first step, maybe, you know, building a lot of stuff in the totally virtual things, but then we also build things in the real world. Uh, and then, you know, since you have this model, so you'll be able to make the real and virtual coexist, right? So this is, uh, you know, uh, showing some of these uh, physical wall is Hong Kong's look like this. And then we have the digital twin, which is, uh, is a kind of a model of the real uh, wall here. And then this is the metaverse. We have, you know, a lot of different things, you know, uh, have the, you see the, the real wall, you see the digital things and they are merged together coexistently. Okay. So the digital twin, we say that is, you know, it can be a large scale, high fidelity digital model, right? And uh, instead of a single one. So basically you have a copy of the real world, but it's not necessarily a one-to-one, -one, not and bounce copy. It can be, you just model, uh, you, you do the abstraction of the important features that, you know, the uh, physical object would be interest uh, for the users in the, in the, in the virtual uh, environment, right? So it refers some of the physical counterpart with the various property, right? So include, for example, if your application in the virtual world is interested in the object motion about, you know, then you capture the object motion. If you are interested in the temperature or even some other functionality that you need it for the, for your digital uh, entity, then you just extract all this uh, property, right? So it does not need to, you know, do a lot of fine tune, uh, you know, fine grain level of modeling. It, those are not important for your for your digital application. Right? So the connection between the physical and virtual twin is tied by the data. So they, you can think, you know, uh, if you think that the digital twin is just the um, 3D modeling of the, uh, the of the physical world, then it's actually a little bit narrow, because you know the ideal case is that those two objects will be tied by the, the data, right? So you can use the data to improve the, the both the physical one and also the virtual one. So when the virtual one world change, right? Then the the the, uh, the so when the physical world change, then the virtual things will be updated, and then you can use the virtual object to do some simulation, for example, in the production line. And when uh, you know we have done some simulation, then you can pass back the data to the physical world to improve the production line over there, right? So then you have kind of you know a loop or changing data that you know the, the data that you have the data to improve both uh, uh, performance. Okay. And then the the digital native is mainly you know mainly about the content creation, right? So you have you know then you have the content creator who is going to. Uh, Perhaps they will be represented as avatar, and then they will be uh, involved in this uh, digital content creation. And I mentioned that they can be, you know, uh, uh, can be uh, artists, or you know, they can game um, gamers. They, they, sorry, they can be the game uh, creators, or you know, they can ask other kind of content creators. And then the content creation actually will be important is that, you know, you need really need them to produce a new economic activity, right? Because we, you, you want to uh, maintain some of this activity over there, they really need. And then, you know, you get even clearer when you get this more, more uh, you know, uh, detailed definition of metaverse, right? We say the metaverse can, uh, could assist as a self-sustaining, right? So, you know, it's, it's, we treat more like, a, a, kind of, you know, uh, ecosystem, it can self-sustain it even, you know, and persistence and it's virtual and it's coexist and interoperate with the physical world with some high level of independence. So you, you can see that we have focus, we have emphasized that self-sustaining, right? So you can have some self-sustaining ability it means that you probably need to have some virtual economy to keep people going there and, you know, doing business, keep people, uh, to keep people going, right? And then you need something, uh, you need money, you need economy, and then you will be able to make sure that it will be kind of uh, self-sustained, right? Uh, of course, you know, there's avatar, the avatar or the other users in the physical world, right? They can experience some hidden genius activity in the real time if they uh, are in the virtual world as well, right? And, you know, of, and uh, theoretically, the metaverse is able to support unlimited number of concurrent users. But as we all, a technical person, we know that it's very difficult, right? That you know, if you want to be able to support uh, uh, even like uh, more than 50, 60 
users on the same uh, virtual uh, reality session is already pretty challenging for today's uh, technology, right? So how would you be able to scale up and then make a lot of people be able to attend, which is not easy even for, I think, a big company like Meta. Okay, so the Metaverse Chronicle, so basically this is just a summary, right? So, be, you know, uh, Snow Crash is here from 1992. So it talked about, you know, the, the, uh, the upper one is the, um, you know, the, the uh, Metaverse related uh, creation, right? Like uh, books, like uh, movies, not movie here, but like books and games and applications, right? And then the uh, below this line are the technology that, you know, emerge at the time. Okay, so you can see that, you know, the first concept was not the, of course, the metaverse keywords, it came from the snow crash, but the concept as we know is not very, it's, it's just like a virtual reality uh, war, right? And the uh, much earlier is the Neuro Mensa. Neuro Mensa was, uh, you know, is a science fiction book by uh, William Gibson, a Canadian American uh, science fiction writer. So he published his book in 1984. So talking about some uh, some hacker which be able to put in some device into their brain and then go into this uh, virtual uh, world. So basically, I think the Matrix movie was actually based on this uh, neural mensas uh, visions, right? And then you you got. Things got changed because we have personal computer come uh, in 1987. They will be able to have some test-based interactive game, of course. And then you know when the computer graphic coming in, right? Then you have uh, in the 1990. Then we have this more active uh, mass virtual world with massive multi-user uh, uh, online game. So they have this active world online traveler second life come in in. Uh, 2003, around the time right, that we have uh, at the end of, you know, uh, towards the end of uh, 90s, right? So we have massive internet usage, we have touchscreen smartphone coming as well at this 2003. And then, you know, Minecraft also then uh, emerged in 2011, around the time then also uh, the cryptocurrency and blockchain also, you know, uh, start taking off. So the things actually you can see that then and the Pokemon goes in 2000, around 2015-16, then there's uh, actually AR gas, and school gas 2013, and then, you know, uh, virtual reality controller. So then, you know, we have this VR chair and Super Mario, Crypto Kitty, actually some NFT enabled game. And then, uh, and then yeah, so this new era of the metaverse which actually they start, uh, uh, you know, the past few years, but people argue that 2021 was the first year of the metaverse, right? You know, um, because uh, you know it got a lot more attention last year. So, but anyway, we think that the, obviously technology serves as a catalyst to drive such transition, right? So everything is driven by technology. So actually, how the next technology comes and how the you know where we really build the metaverse or from our all you know our understanding about virtual reality about augmented reality and the technology coming from VR and AR is going to play a very important role of shaping how the metaverse will go in the future. So I think this actually is pretty interesting uh, a picture to show to uh, the, the users right that you know or even to the researchers so we're trying to come up with this, you know, putting all the application with not all of them, right? But some of these application popular ones that already available, and also the kind of we're trying to categorize them and you know put them into this map. And then we're trying to think about you know what we can do, what space we can go for, for the metaverse. So we can see that you uh, here the the SSS are the richness of the content. Okay, so it come from uh, on the left hand side is the lowest, uh, you know, it's, it's not as rich as the right side, right? So you go to go from the left to the right. So the content richness increase, okay? And then, you know, uh, the, the YSS are the, uh, the way of personalization and users in, in you know, uh, inter essence, you know. So basically it's the, the, the level of personalization and uh, users engagement uh, into this uh, into this content uh, created. So, you know, you can see that, uh, for example, the lower level of the YSS is the read and write, right? So basically, you know, you know it's just the same, you know, the, the essence, for example, you send a text message and read a text message, it doesn't have any personalized 
experience, right? So, you know, the right and right. But, the, you know, but then the, the content richness increase, right? You can see that from the text and then to image and to audios and to video and gaming, virtual world, VR, right? And mixed reality, AR, and, you know, uh, virtually mixed AI and VR and uh, mixed reality, they are pretty uh, similar anyway. And then we have a physical world, right? So, you know, the, of the, 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 the richness increase. And then you go uh, from the Y and you can see that read and write, which you know, they, there's no difference in the experience. And then you have personalization that some of things are personalized to, uh, according to the user. For example, uh, Netflix. Netflix know what you like and Netflix you recommend movie to you or Netflix uh, drama to you, right? And then, you know, the, uh, also the Fortnite, one of these uh, VR game that user can create their own avatar, right? But the but then you know uh yeah you have some personalized experience rather than the you know the everyone have the same experience or you know for the read and write case and then you have the the next level is the content creation that the users not only be able to engage to get personalized experience they also be able to create their own contents right so like YouTube YouTube be able to you know. You know, we have a lot of user generated content that we generate our content and put into YouTube. And then the robots is another, is on the virtual 3D thing, right? The robots and the user also can generate, create their content, but you cannot, you cannot create your content on the Fortnite game, right? But then this is content creation and, you know, another level is a social, you know, social as a community, as we are social animals. So we also, you know, want to talk about this engagement. So, so, so in this case that, you know, for example, TikTok allow the user to, to do social, right? So, so that you can engage the uh, social communities over there. So it's another level of uh, up, right? And then also Second Life, actually, you, you also have more social function. Uh, over there as a community. Of course, uh, you know, robots, you can also do some social, but you know, um, uh, yeah, the second life actually uh, get another level. And then uh, the metaverse things, a uh, space we are with, you know, we're talking about duality, right? That, you know, that how the virtual and the real things can be coexist, right? So this space that, you know, is still missing. Uh, in, in, some of this can do some uh, limited functionality, but you know, the, the level of duality, the physical and uh, digital coexistence is the space to be more uh, exposed by the, in the metaverse space. And then also the per 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 perpetual, right? Because we talk about persistency, that how the contents created in the virtual world can be, uh, uh, can stay persistently, right? So who is going to, generate so this artwork is generated who is going to maintain them whether you know we need some museum to archive them to make sure that some digital creation they have some archiving value will be also kept uh, in some kind of you know archive uh, uh, facility over there right so this space are things that we believe that you know uh, uh, researchers can explore more in this uh, metaverse space Okay, so uh, so what really the technology point of view, right? So uh, so these are the pillars and this uh, ecosystem that we look at, at but I'm going to keep this uh, pictures later, uh, you know, in the, uh, you know, when we talk about the future directions, but here at least that the, the technology that we need to build a metaverse. So you can see that the, it, the metaverse is, uh, you know, it's a kind of integrated system or platform or, uh, or some, you know, something which is integrated, you know, you build with the software and, you know, you, know, you add in hardware and software together, you build something uh, which is called the metaverse. So the metaverse, you know, uh, itself, it rely on some technology that, you know, to support it, right? So what kind of technology is needed uh, for enable the metaverse? We can see that the, AR, VR, or extended reality is one important part because no matter whether it's a totally VR virtual version or the, you know as a AR version, right? That you still need the technology to as a you know as an entrance as a gateway to get into the metaverse. So, uh, so people actually ask, you know, what's the difference between metaverse and uh, extended reality or virtual reality? You know, so usually the as we know that the AR, VR, they are technology, right? So they are we have some hardcore technology over there, but the 
metaverse is kind of uh, integration, you know, it's not really a technology cell, but you know, it's kind of an integration of some technology together to create a system, a platform, or, you know, uh, or even we say the ecosystem for some functionality over there. But itself is uh, it's not really, a, you know, a, a typical uh, specific technology, okay? And then, of course, you also need some use, user interactivity. So, how the users in, interact with each other in the virtual world, or you know, how the users can interact with the virtual object, or how the user can interact with another avatar in the virtual environment. Right. So, those things are the uh, interactivity. So, basically, more from the human computer interaction point of view. And then, of course, you know. Uh, Computer vision as well. So today we have a speaker also talk about uh, some of this computer vision, uh, you know, uh, you know, segmentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they're important, uh, of course, right? So you know, you also that's the level of putting things on the stack actually uh, showing some dependency also also there, right? So extended uh, 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 reality and uh, human interaction they are. Their technology, but they are, you know, they also rely on other technology like computer vision, AI, and robotic, right? Uh, IoT that was going to give you some input as a sensors. And then, you know, they also some rely on the edge, you know, cloud because, you know, you need things to process, right? You need uh, somewhere, you know, servers to process data to render some of these, uh, you know, your, your images. And then, of course, the network as well that, you know, uh, we need the network to transfer the data. We need a low latency to reduce, for example, VR, you know, you need really low latency. So you have, you know, you don't have so much about the, the sickness issues or, and, and then, you know, of course the hardware infrastructure, which can be the GPU, uh, CPU, those things, uh, you know, which are the technology enable, enable technology for AR, VR, and also for the uh, metaverse, of course. Okay, so these are uh, things actually I already mentioned, right? The uh, the edge things, and uh, so we're going to show you some kind of data later about why the edge and the network latency are so important in uh, in in for the this uh, ecosystem. So once say we say we get everything, we, we build the metaverse, but is is it the end of story? No, definitely, right? Because the metaverse would not self sustain. It would not persistently be there. It would not be independent from our virtual world. It there are no. Uh, it will still let something to run the, to keep this ecosystem running. So, besides hard technology, you know, below we still need some kind of you know we call it maybe soft technology to keep the ecosystem running. So, what are the things include right uh, in this uh, in in this soft part right? So we have we need avatar, you know, the avatar creation technology, how to create the avatar, how to make sure that the avatar is socially acceptable, how to make sure that the avatar can reflect some of our, you know, emotion, our gesture, right? So those things are uh, very important. And then we also need, you know, content creation without the content that nobody is going to go to the, the, the this metaverse, right? So, you know, usually we go there to either social or uh, you know, enjoy some contents of, you know, have some entertainment, right? So you need content creation. Then, uh, and in order to make sure that, you know, things will be, uh, we will have the content creation, we need a virtual economy, right? So we need some people, uh, economy which is uh, sustainable that, you know, to keep people going, to keep people creating. So uh, virtual economy is very, uh, it's also an essential part for, for, for the ecosystem. And then we also talk about social acceptability, whether you know your avatar, whether your behavior is socially acceptable or not. And then of course, uh, security and privacy with the, all these available device that you have your headset, you have your, you know, your, your, your motion sensor, you have your, you know, EMG sensor, right? So you got actually much more data is going to be going to the system. So how, you know, we trust somebody is going to keep our data safe, you know, although, you know, you know, for some company, right? That even, how can we trust them, right? And then of course the trust and accountability problem as well, right? For example, your avatar, you create, I have my avatar and you create your avatar actually look the same as my avatar and you use your avatar to create 
to to you know you know to to cause some trouble to something or attack someone, right? So who is going to be uh taking the uh accountant uh you know to be accounted for this uh, attack the all this assault, right? So there's a uh, and, and also how my you know in the real world I I trust you I trust you young because we know each other you know uh so we have some you know experience also contact right so and uh, we know that Yuan is a real human right but how my avatar will trust an avatar in the virtual world which also you know uh, things that we need to investigate so there are a lot of things and uh and we can do and it need to be done and uh here are some of the the, the more summary of about this okay so uh technology uh which are also uh the ecosystem uh which you know we, we, we categorize into different uh, areas as i just mentioned and the things that we believe that need to be done over there right so for example ai you need some probably some automatic digital twin right so you you may not want to just use your manually to create a digital uh, twin you may want some more automatic method with uh, with the ai to generate the uh, digital twin for the uh, from the physical world right and then you may need some kind of computer agent like uh, agent smith in the uh, in the matrix who is going to make keeping some of these orders of the virtual world running okay or the metaverse running and then blockchain and you know you can see also the even the ecosystem part right the avatar the appearance and design the user perceptions the human avatar in the essence and avatar in the uh, in, in the wild for example right and then uh like uh, when you talk about the edge computer and there were, you know, a distributed federated learning for say, you know, for your data, your privacy, all this uh, enhancement, okay? So there's a lot of things that have to, to, to be done. And, 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 you know, we, I think we are still at the very beginning. So, uh, yeah, so I've, yeah, so this VR, and uh, I think you are very familiar with, so we just, uh, not going too much detail on the slide so you are interested in to look into the slide as well and also ar right so ai is kind of you know uh currently there's you know the main point is that you know um uh, i'm going to show you that uh, the uh, the hardware is a part of this is of course it's a useful as still right that you now we have you know both ar and vr headset so vr headset you have the oculus so you know i i can see that for you mainly are using Oculus, so now it's the price is pretty good. But then for some of these AR headset, you know, you really want to get a high quality one that's still uh, pretty expensive. Of course, you can argue that we can use some smartphone, so we can uh, lower the you know entry for the users to go into the AR, right? And then uh, of course it's uh, we also then we go into this uh, immersive issues. So right? how can we with the uh, create better immersion on the, uh, you know, even we are using the uh, the smartphone has, uh, hand, handset. And then, uh, yeah, so those uh, AR VR stuff, I think you are very familiar and they are important and they are serving as an entrance or gateway to the metaverse. And then the user technology, I, I, I also give you some kind of, you know, uh, uh, quickly uh, talk about this, right? So, you know, we need the input, right? We need the uh, how to, you know, we, they're not even talking about you know just interact with the avatar virtual things a virtual object but you know even simple thing about how do we actually type uh, enter data in this uh, virtual uh, in, in the metaverse right so do we enter things with a keyboard or uh, you know we use our voice to do some control or we do you know uh, uh, you know we, we write on the you know in the mid air those are things that we need to to really uh, look into right because you know the time they're spending performing some tasks actually can get you a lot of uh, you know uh, you know tire tiredness in your muscle as well right and then besides the input there will be a feedback as well right so you need some kind of up you know of course input output and then you need some kind of feedback visual feedback which you you want to display the digital content to the users right and uh, then the, then then we also come to this the feedback cues as you know how you're going to give some Cues to the users uh, either in the in the way of audios or haptic or you know muscle force feedback etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So the input technology is pretty. Uh, there's quite a, a, quite many of them available. Um, 
So involve some on body uh, interaction technique and you know some of, also everyday object over there. You can use your hand gesture. You can use some wearable things on your muscles to get some of your signal from your muscle, right? And to to do all this kind of control and you know even contain some kind of smart skin and uh, smart textile that you can use as an input. So this is a summary of some kind of uh, SR interaction solution. So uh, yeah, you, you would talk about, you know, uh, for example, test entry, you can use ha your hand mid air, you can use, uh, you can decide some uh, go go, you can, uh, you can control, you know, type on these things. And then, you know, maybe, you know, you can use your force, different kind of force level to, to do some control. And then there's also some kind of, you know, embodiedness into essence, some, uh, some other uh, stuff like hum like more potential human, uh, inter uh, technology into essence like a voice command, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's things ongoing, right? And this is actually one of the things that we have done in the lab, you know, uh, two years ago, two or three years ago. So basically, we were we're trying to look at the test entry, right? How do you enter the test in the? Uh, how do you type? So this is actually a, a Hololens one. So this is a few of you are Hololens one, and you can see that. Uh, you want to put a keyboard here, right? So the keyboard, you know, you, of course you can type on keyboard or uh, mid air, but the keyboard can be pretty big, right? That, you know, you probably only cover half on your field view. Uh, you want to get a, a creative keyboard display over here. So, which is not very good, right? Because uh, your field of view, uh, HoloLens one is already pretty small, right? You've got a keyboard, it's actually getting even smaller. So we, our solution was that, you know, let's do a, uh, keywordless uh, entry, right? So you can imagine that there's a line, which is an imaginary line, and then the different location of the line is corresponding to different uh, uh, characters. So, you know, you move your hand to the those line, and then, you know, you create, select maybe five characters is on, on that portion, and then you can then uh, further select the, uh, the the asset keyword, right? So you can see the he want to tie, the student want to tie researcher, right? Research. So then he just move your hand in a different uh, place and then you can do some recall. Uh, if there's something wrong, you move your hand back and then you do some recall. So uh, basically you, uh, you know, it's not very fast, but you'll be able to do all this uh, input without, uh, without keyboard. Okay. And then we also design some golf like this, that, you know, you, uh, the users can uh, use different level of the force, force level to do the, the, the input, you know, uh, uh, or, or to to do is to to the to do the input right. So you know, for example, you can uh, we input this. So this uh, sensor have like four, uh, three force levels. So you know you, you know depending on light touch and uh, kind of shallow force touch and then deep force touch. And you have three level and you three level can correspond to three kind of characters. And then you you can fit in this for input. And this is another demo about using, for example, uh, different force level to, con to, to control the, the, the drone. So you're just using one hand, one finger. So the goal is to actually to implement this as a ring on, on your hand. So you can wear this ring and then you can uh, just use different level on, on your movement, your arm uh, or your hand, and then you can control, perform different kind of you know, movement of the, uh, the drone over there. Okay. And uh, and then there's another live demo, which is a little bit uh, further that, you know, we demonstrate how actually uh, we use this um, Google Glass at the time is pretty old things so to, to implement some system, which can allow user to, do, you know, uh, to do uh, file transfer, for example, right? It's kind of, you know, you can use your hand to add and drop this content and move from computer to another computer, just use, uh, yeah, you know, uh, hand gesture control, right? And uh, and the another uh, demo is, you know, you use this hand, uh, your hand, and then move the file and put into a projector and drop in the projector, and then it's it's display on the projector. So just some uh, proof of concept, a demo about you know the interaction over there. Okay, then I think this kind of view of view, kind of you know vision things actually you. Uh, I guess many of us here are know already, and you know, uh, and so if you are more interested into uh, doing all these hap tap things about you know feedback about to the users, right? So we have a, a survey paper, which actually was uh, 
uh, just published uh, December, uh, actually, actually just pub uh, published last year, uh, October uh, 2021. But the, the work actually, we, we have finished the paper very early, like in 2016 already, but you know, sometimes we've got a lot of time to, to, to get a paper published. So this paper has been revised and we submit and add in a lot of content in the past, you know, uh, six years already. And uh, so that paper provide you a lot of detail. If you want to talk, you want to work on the uh, AR, you know, uh, haptic uh, technology for AR, or actually also some of them are for VR. So then I got another five minutes. I'm going to go quickly uh, to some of these uh, things. So uh, yeah, so IoT and metaverse. Basically, we say that for IoT, they, they as uh, entry, you know, as a uh, uh, collecting data and going to, we can use the data to create the digital model, digital twin, and you also use the data to actually at least sensor for interessence, right? So you support better interessence with uh, these available sensors. And then the AI roles, basically about the digital twin. So actually I already mentioned that the digital model, which are only the copy of the, you know, of the digital world, right? And then you also have digital shadow that the physical world will affect the digital object, but that's the digital object would not have any influence on the digital uh, on the physical object. But the digital twin vision is much better that you have the way that you have this interaction between the physical and digital with the, the data flowing, right? So, <clears throat> so it have been you know being used actually. Uh, the uh, typical uh, example I will give you about metaverse in, in, in this scenario is the, uh, the Omniverse by NVIDIA, right? So you can see that the uh, Omniverse platform of, by NVIDIA have been used for comp uh, you know, uh, a lot of manufacturer, man manufacturer like a BMW for their factory. So actually use a lot of this uh, concept from digital twins and AI uh, uh, technology. And then the computer uh, agent, right? The, the how to create the uh, computer agent that this agent can keep the maintain some orders in this uh, digital world also uh, in important uh, research problem. And then blockchain, right? So blockchain technology, I would just mention one thing is about the NFT. So basically the, you know, in the past, you know, uh, the second life of, you know, Minecraft, they are, they, they are virtual world, right? But then there's no ownership that you, uh, or even not talking about this virtual world, you, you know, in the past when you create some digital art, right? So, so you cannot claim your ownership, right? Then actually, you know, because you people just copy and paste and copy and screenshot, right? So the digital art would not be, you know, because it's digital, right? So you cannot difficult, uh, you have difficulty of claiming your ownership. And also you have the uh, difficulty of uh, maintaining the scarcity, right? So basically, you know, other people can come and copy your picture for thousands or millions of time, right? You have no control. So the uh, the I think the blockchain and also NFT technology play an important role is they enable that you have the ownership. So basically now you you can uh, you uh, as artists you can create your art and then you put it into NFT so you can you know have your ownership actually claim that is uh, you own you you have the ownership of it. So these are some, uh, yeah, some some kind of ecosystem, some games uh, that actually because of this uh, this blockchain and NFT technology, there's a lot of uh, you know uh, they call it metaverse game which is ongoing over there, right? So uh, so one example is the the sandbox is uh, what kind of virtual real as uh, real uh, real estate uh, thing, right? That you know people buy and uh, selling lands on this, uh, this virtual world called Sandbox. And uh, it's pretty uh, crazy uh, activity over there, you know, especially last year, right? So someone in Hong Kong actually bought a land, a piece of land on this virtual world for, for 5 million US dollars, right? So uh, actually, yeah, so basically they are using, you know, you enable your environment to build some of your animation models, and then you get a marketplace for you to add, to, 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 to sell your stuff. And then you also have a, a, a game maker, which allow you to make some games on your land, but only you own that land that you can make the games over there, right? So it's uh, heavily reuse some of this uh, is it, uh, NFT technology like ELC 20 and, you know, uh, standard ELC 1155, ELC uh, 721. So those are the, the uh, NFT standards, okay? 
uh, right, so those are things that we cover. So I'm going to not go too much. Uh, I'm going to conclude my talk in five minutes. So basically be before talking about this, I just show you some things. I think it's important when you are making AR or VR apps yourself, right? So there are some challenges and constraints. So the AR pipeline, usually, you know, we have been a pretty heavy uh, duration, right? So, you know, you do, do uh, so this are uh, you know AR pipeline. So from the input from the camera, so you have the frame pre-processing, and then you have the object detection, feature extraction, object recognition, template matching. Of course, you go to database for do some query, getting your uh your uh, you know get the uh, match of your your object over there, right? And then you get the visual content. So those those things are you know can be a, they have different level of heaviness uh, in terms of computation, right? So object detection and um, uh, the darker the color means that the more heavy load that task would need on computing. Okay, so object recognition is heavy, database query is also heavy, and uh, so you can do it in the device itself or you can do it in the server, right? And some people, uh, you know, some company like especially the hardware five G company, they say, okay, with the five G we can resolve all these issues with the you know by making the how the the, the uh, the network faster, right? But you know, we did also this end-to-end -end latency breakdown for you here. Then it tell you that the network transfer, you assume a 50 millisecond network transfer latency, right? So it's, you know, of course it's not super low, but we're talking about a typical uh, funds to, for some of funds to Germany, maybe, you know, 50 millisecond network transfer. So the data, the network transfer is actually, I can't, only less than 20% of the late end-to-end -end latency, right? A lot of latency are coming from, you know, the other part like object recognition, feature access, and et cetera, right? So it's compressing the network is not uh, uh, going to solve all this end-to-end -end latency issue for the AR, right? So you need to actually use better algorithm, use better computing facility to compress the, uh, the uh, latency from the other part, okay? And then for the VR case, I think you uh, you guys probably already uh, very familiar with that the issue is about the, you want to have the uh, very good VR experience, right? That we have, we need to have a very high resolution, which is around, you want to have, a, uh, you know, people with the 2020 eyesight, right? We require uh, 3,600 pixel between one degree by one degree area, right? So basically you need 16 degree resolution. You want to have a, uh, for 360 degree video, right? So, you know, the bit rate can be very high, you know, you, you have a demand on network, you need, you know, uh, or even decoding is a problem, you know, uh, even with the GPU server, right? So there's some issues that you want to support uh, a metaverse that you, they have to face uh, with. So I'm going to just keep skip uh, here. So I'm uh, let me, uh, let me go to the last slide uh, that we have here and I make a conclusion. Then we go to some uh, questions. Uh, okay, um, so this is going to be my last slide. So the last slide is about uh, the future issues, right? So what are the future issues? Uh, so I have covered quite a lot of uh, pillars and also with the uh, for the technology enablers and also cover the pillar for the metaverse ecosystem. So anything, you know, there's still a lot of space to improve, right? As, as beginning of this metaverse, we know even for VR research, there's still a lot of uh, technical issues to even enable a multi-person interaction in this uh, VR space. So for VR, AR, there's a uh, uh, issues like, uh, to, to, to do, right? For example, uh, for full, full integration of virtual and real environment, super realism, multi cyberspace user collaboration. So these are pretty challenging still, right? So it has lots of data and synchronization issues and, you know, find accurate uh, registration. How do you do this registration on uh, on a very huge world model, right? So, you know, you, you, you detect something and then how you're going to match this to a huge world model, which contain the 3D modeling of our, our real world, right? So it's still pretty challenging. And then probably something also related, you know, uh, for example, the edge and cloud, right? For example, last mile latency, how do you deal with this? And and then also issues about, you know, uh, of course about data transparency and data privacy in the in the bot, uh, blockchain aspect as well. And we, we uh, you know, 
uh, virtual economy, how can we do interwar access management, how can we do low carbon NFT transaction is now the Ethereum is terrible for the uh, carbon neutral or carbon uh, low carbon uh, stuff, right? And then what happened about is uh, economic crisis and decentralized uh, government issues. So there's still a lot of things we need to do, to solve, you know, if we want to move uh, forward. But I think these are the uh, the physical the the social aspect are as important as the uh, the solid. Uh, technology over there, right? So I, you know, more attention actually should be, you know, looking at this uh, uh, social and, uh, you know, uh, social acceptability, trust and accountability issues from the people from the sociology or from the other fields. We are not necessarily the computer scientists. Okay. So I think I will stop here and I, uh, I see any questions. And thank you for your uh, listening here. Thanks for your presentation. And uh, in this presentation, we know from Ben that uh, the history, the great history of metaverse and, and also some technology how to build the, the metaverse. For example, use user interactivity and using artificial intelligence, digital twin and the blockchain, and also using blockchain to claim the ownership in the, in the metaverse. Yes, we have one question in the Discord system. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, yeah so great work what do you think what impact this technology will would have on our real life and do you think users acceptance and dependence dependence could be a nice research questions yeah i think uh, yeah we, we actually uh yeah, definitely right uh, actually my fault actually we have uh, putting a lot of things about you know how these uh, how these things we affect our, our our life right so we have a lot of issues that we need to to consider for example about the uh, of course uh, originally right that uh, people actually worry that you know uh, uh, there's an argument about you know whether this uh, AR VR or metaverse technology actually will keep the personal distance longer or or, or shorter, right? So you are, you are talking about you know uh, social life, right? That if everybody just go and have their social life in the in the metaverse, that actually we, we, we you may have less social interaction in the real world, right? Which can be some uh, issue, of course. But then on the other hand, right, with this technology actually we can also bring the closer the people, right? For example, now you, everybody are online and you know, with the Zoom, we'll be able to have a, arrange a meeting over there. So there's uh, such kind of uh, closer and uh, further issues that will impact our life, of course, right? And uh, people also talk about addition, right? For example, uh, the children may get edited into these uh, virtual uh, space and just stay there uh, and, and don't come out, right? And uh, and this kind of you know uh, privacy issues that may also impact our life. Of course, or there's also positive things that we can also have a better meeting environment, right? That now rather than doing our workshop in the in the uh, Zoom, we can also have our workshop in the virtual space that everybody have uh, all of us have our avatar, and you I can see your face person, you can see mine. So. Uh, so you know, no matter whether we are in New Zealand or in France or in Europe or in uh, other European country or you know in in Korea or China, right? So we can be able to have a presence in the uh, metaverse space with a very nice uh, uh, immersiveness, right? So those technology can be, uh, of course, can be useful. And uh, other thing, you now there's uh, ethical uh, issue. For example, a uh, lot of things that we need to do, right? So, uh, who is going to regulate the metaverse? So, you create the metaverse. Who is going to to regulate them, right? And there's a lot of can be a lot of uh, illegal behavior over there, and uh, uh, and uh, and there's government issue, right? At what region of the law that we have to follow in the in the metaverse, right? So, are you following uh, the law from the country that you live, or are you uh, you know, following the law of the country that you perform some economic activity, right? So those are actually pretty a lot of uh, issues. And then of course the social activity is also definitely things we need to look at. For example, uh, uh, what, what, you know, even for the meta, uh, for the avatar design, right? So can you, are you supposed to uh, control the size of your avatar? You know, your avatar may be very big and then people 
cannot see it or your avatar may be, you know, uh, putting a lot of, you know, uh, racist, uh, you know, symbol over there, right? Those, those definitely are not so, so acceptable. Or what happened if you are wearing a huge AR headset and you know, walking the street, right? So maybe uh, people also don't want to, uh, don't feel comfortable, right? So there's, uh, there's pretty much a lot of issues on socially and also emotionally uh, uh, over there that we need to take care. Of. But uh, yeah, so today I just got enough time to cover the uh, technology aspect. So if you are interested also into the uh, uh, more social and also uh, you know uh, trust and privacy issues, I, I would recommend you to you know continue looking at. This slide. So at behind there's also a discussion about the accountability and also some grand challenge, and you know, and also the paper that we also you can also download the paper from uh, Google the title and you have more cover about the eco virtual economy and also the social issues that we just mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And also we have a question from Tibot. He asked us. What would be the ecological impact of such a system? Uh, yeah, ecological impact, of course, right? So uh, yes. typically, uh, you know, all this. Um, so first, right, we have this uh, Bitcoin uh, or, you know, Ethereum or this blockchain activity, actually pretty uh, carbon, uh, you know, uh, unfriendly, right? So they, they kind of created a lot of uh, computing, which is not very good for the environment, actually. So, uh, so the, the, as I mentioned, though, the one of the solution is how to how can we lower this uh, carbon uh, you know emission of the NFT right so, so those are area that we need to 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 expect and also building the virtual wall maybe you know like uh, what Facebook or Meta imagine actually you would need a lot of computational power right so you, you're rendering a virtual wall for like. Uh, millions, even billions of people, you know, we are talking about a lot of data center have to build, a lot of computing have to be done, right? So those things can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, have some issue with the, our, 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 you know, carbon uh, emission, right? But on the other hand, right, we'll be able to do all this, uh, uh, you know, conference or, you know, uh, you know meetings and or even teaching remotely, that you know, instead of I travel to New Zealand to get a presentation, I I be able to have a very nice physical you know telepresence uh, to be in New Zealand with you guys. Actually, I don't need to take the airplane, right? Actually, that in that sense, you have uh, it reduce the carbon emission. So we can we, we need some kind of a better uh, mathematical model, you know, to do and to evaluate, you know. You know, you know, as some aspect like the network as well, right? That we computing with the, you know, networking we increase the carbon emission. But on the other hand, you know, for the communication, we reduce the carbon emission from traveling. So I think it's a big complicated uh, uh, mathematical issues that we you know we need someone to do a better model on this. But I, I, I this is my general answer. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I also receive another question. How do you see the industrial application for the metaverse in industrial yeah. field? Okay, yeah, I think at the beginning, the uh, the application are more in the industry rather than the uh, uh, commercial use you know, for the metaverse. At the moment, you know, for the commercial use, of course, there are some uh, VR chair, there are some, you know, uh, Microsoft Maps with for meeting and, uh, and, and you know, uh, for you to have a meeting a better with the avatar, right? So there's, uh, there's uh, the commercial uh, or, or, or consumer side actually at the moment is 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 pretty limited, uh, yeah, still limited. But the industry ones actually uh, a lot more people uh, are using in the industry for this uh, industry 4.0 in you know in digital twin aspect. That for example, uh, a notable one I mentioned is Nvidia uh, Omnibus, right? That and many company actually are already using Omnibus, and. Uh, you look at this video of Nvidia release last year, right? To the end of 2021. So the uh, the founder of Nvidia and he actually present a lot of user case for including you know BMW is using uh, building the digital twin of their manufacturer you know uh, car manufacturer line. So they they did a lot of you know simulation on the uh, or even resource allocation simulation on the uh, 
on the omnibus before they actually deploy things into the manufacturing uh, you know, factory, right? And they saw that they actually, they, that improved their productions and also uh, be very uh, useful for their, and there, there's quite other company as well, they're using this. So I, I, I would actually see that the, the industry usage actually would be even uh, before the users because the users we need to, uh, the entry point, right? The, the you know, uh, to, to buy in all this equipment like HoloLens 2, you know, they are pretty expensive, but right? maybe a normal user may not want to invest so much money. And also there's this uh, social accessibility issues, but for the industry, they have money, they can actually, I will see that they will go uh, a step even before the consumer end of, uh, of things. Okay. And the, uh... Okay, another question from the audience. Do you think what, uh, what is the difference between metaverse and uh, virtual reality? Because yeah. both uh, provide immersive env environments to the user. Okay, very good question. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I mentioned at the beginning, right, that uh, VR and AR, they are uh, technology, right? So they're the uh, enable technology. They're the technology enable with uh, metaverse. And uh, metaverse, I would treat more like uh, Ecosystem or system uh, integrate system rather than uh, uh, you know uh, a, a solid technology itself, right? So we can see that the metaverse is uh, uh, you know construct it use VR or AR as entry to a space. Okay, so you need this technology to go in there, but it's not only about the technology itself. It's mm -hmm. about how to maintain an ecosystem which allow people to uh, uh, you know. Uh, enable a, a ecosystem which can be self-sustained we can you know can persistent over there and can be you know less depend on the human world right so basically involve mm. things to push the ecosystem to run including you know virtual economy to keep people going and creating content over there so it's kind of you know uh, uh pretty different from my my my, my point of view yeah okay and uh, do you think what is uh, would be the major breakthrough for is a uh, real metaverse in the future? I the yeah, the, yeah. yeah. The, the the major breakthrough of the yes. uh, the yeah I think the major breakthrough I think you know there are different aspect right so there's. Uh, it, we want to do a build a metaverse like what uh, Facebook uh, described, right? We it need a, a few a different kind of aspect that you need to look at. First, you need to have the headset, right? You need to have the hardware which can be a uh, very low cost. Yeah. Any people can use it, right? And the headset technology, the VR technology that you will be able to allow users to stay in the virtual world longer time, right? And then you also have the immersive issues that you will be able to get all these uh, sensors to the user, so the user can have a better immersiveness or presence in the virtual world. And of course, these multiple users interaction, which is extremely important, right? You you just go in the virtual world, you, you cannot interact with each other, you can only, you know, type some tests into each other that actually not uh, very useful. And then I think the last thing, uh, uh, I think you need to make a uh, big uh, breakthrough is the, uh, you know, the issue is about maintaining, you know, scalability, right? How can you scale up, uh, you know, the system not only allow a couple of people, but, you know, how can you enable thousands of even tens of thousands of more people to, to you know, interact, socialize, you know, like a normal life, which is a uh, uh, challenge. Okay. 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 I don't know for people in the in the room if you have any questions you can ask uh, Prof Panhui directly. Mm -hmm. Hello. What, for our audience, do you have any questions? Okay. Okay. If there's no questions, we we really appreciate uh, the presentation of Panhui and. Uh, so I think uh, we will yeah. go to the the next step. It's uh, we will have a closing remark from uh, or another organizer, Dr. Li Kehang. So would you like to talk uh, some, something now? Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah. So uh, again, thanks for the uh, inspiring talk. 
uh, delivered by Professor Pan Hui. Um, so uh, this talk, uh, we can see uh, the importance of the metaverse. And then we can also see the, um, how the data um, is related to the uh, metaverse or XR, even though maybe we, we can only see the metaverse in the next decade. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Professor Penhoi, we are at the beginning of the metaverse, right? Professor Penhoi, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, based on this, uh, we can, uh, I, I see some uh, interesting presentation. One is uh, collecting uh, the, the environmental uh, information that build up the, um, the, the user context. So we can see that uh, if we want to build a metaverse, we need the, those informations. And, they, uh, and we can see the importance of data-driven approach. Uh, if you want to know more about the metaverse, actually here is um, uh, advertising. Uh, tomorrow, there is a, um, uh, another workshop uh, chaired by uh, Professor Pan Hui. Um, is The name is MetaView. And there will be a panel discussion. And I think Professor Penhoi will be there and other authors of that survey, the survey we uh, uh, delivered, uh, sorry, the survey presented today, um, I think most authors will be there. So we can have a more in-depth discussion. And uh, again, thanks for uh, everyone's contribution and participation in this workshop. Okay, thank you. So we hope to to see you next year. Maybe we we will organize another the next session of data for XR. Feel free to contact contact us if you have any comments and uh, suggestions to make. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>